Mega Ven and Tolkien fans, and welcome to the new edition of Luminaria, where this week we're going to be discussing songs in Tolkien, with a particular emphasis on the first age. Now, anyone who's read a little bit of Tolkien knows that he likes a good song, so we're going to take a look at some of these and see if we can discover any themes. Um, we are mainly going to be focusing on the first age, but there's a couple of really good ones that crop up in the third age that we'll be taking a look at as well. Um, so there's going to be a few short readings, uh, but don't worry, I'm not going to sing to you. Now, most of the th in the third age, most of the songs that crop up are songs that have already been written. They're, they've been written by somebody else about events that have already happened. Um, like there's Bilbo's The Road Goes On and Never On, which he gives to Frodo, who also sings it. Um, there's Bilbo's song again in Rivendell about Air Randall. <clears throat> and there's the bathing song, which they sing at Crick Hollow in Frodo's new house. Um, but there's one that Sam sings later on which really stands out which we'll get to later so there seems to be two main types of singing in the Silmarillion in the first stage so we'll deal with the first one first um, most of the songs in the Silmarillion come out because the hero has almost completely given up hope um, I say hero sometimes heroine um, the protagonist has almost completely given up hope so they literally sit down and in Fingon's case pull out a harp and just start singing and they hand themselves over to the higher powers. So it's important to note that this is not true hopelessness in the true sense. This is a world where the gods are real and they have a practical influence in the world. Most of the Noldor, most of the elves in Silmarillion have met um, who the Romans would could Vulcan. They've met the, the force of nature embodied who is Yavanna who gives birth, well, not gives birth, but um, who creates the Ents and who creates the the trees of Valinor. Um, so when they when they have given up hope, they're actually giving themselves over to a higher power completely. Um, it's an act of what a more religious person would call faith. Now there's a statement that Eru makes, um, Eru the main god god, at the start of the book in Jan Lindley. He says, "Non can alter the music in my despite, for he that shall attempt it this shall but prove mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful." And the idea is that there's the elves are kind of aware of this. They say it's a good stroke of chance, if chance it be. It is whenever something fortuitous happens, there's a chance that it's not actually fortune, but it's actually the hand of God himself, as it were. So to begin with, we're going to look at when the elf Madros has been captured by Morgoth and after a big battle and he's basically been nailed to this big mountainside and Fingon has gone off to help him, Fingon's his cousin, gone off to help him and um, can't find a way through so he just sits and pulls his harp out and starts singing. <clears throat> High upon the shoulders of Thangorodrim the mountains he climbed and looked in despair upon the desolation of the land but no passage or crevice could he find through which he might come within Morgoth's stronghold. Then in defiance of the orcs, who cowered still in the dark, vaults beneath the earth, he took his harp and sang a song of Valinor that the Noldor made of old before strife was born among the sons of Finway, and his voice rang in the mournful hollows that had never heard aught before save cries of woe and fear. Thus Fingon found what he sought, for suddenly, above him, far and faint, his song was taken up, and a voice answered called him. Madros it was that sang amid his torment. So this chap's surrounded by orcs completely. There's he's heading into the stronghold of the enemy, and he can't see anywhere to go. So he literally sits down, pulls his harp out, potentially in full audio reach of the orcs, and to start singing. He literally gives himself over to his high power, and lo and behold, Madros hears him and calls that back and takes his song and starts singing back to him. And uh, I think that's quite wonderful. So the next one, again, a very similar situation, is Beren, who is a, a man, a mortal man. He has been given an impossible task by the father of the elf lady that he falls in love with, his, his, uh, the, the, the maiden Luthien. Um, he's been asked to go and get a Silmaril, one of these gems, title of the book. He's been asked to grab a Silmaril from the crown of the Lord of Darkness, Morgoth. 
and he said look sorry I'm gonna go and do that because I love this chick and she's all right so he's headed off on his own he's left Luffy in asleep and he's just gone out on his own and he's gone across league after league of awful land and he's heading straight into to Ang Ban the, the fortress of darkness of who is effectively Satan of the Silmarillion and there he sees the peaks of Thangordrim and he dismisses his horse and bade it leave now dread and so to and run free upon the green grass in the lands of Sirion which is where the river flows and it's all lovely then being alone now and upon the threshold of the final per peril he made the song of passing in praise of Luthien and the lights of heaven for he believed that he must now say, say farewell to both love and light of that song these words are part Farewell, sweet earth and northern sky, for ever blessed since here did lie, and here with lissom limbs did run beneath the moon, beneath the sun, Luthien to Nuviel, more fair than mortal tongue can tell. The wall to ruin fell the world, and were dissolved and backward hurled. Unmade into the old abyss, yet were its making good for this, the dusk, the dawn, the earth, the sea, that Luthien for a time should be. And he sang aloud, caring not what ear should overhear him for he was desperate and looked for no escape but luthien heard his song and she sang in answer as she came through the woods unlooked for so again facing absolute mortal peril he's standing there above the stronghold of the enemy and just gives up hands himself over and just starts singing and luthien hears him luthien finds him and they go on, spoiler alert, they complete their mission. So, this is all part of the fate and free will question that kind of keeps cropping up in some reading. Is it fate? Is it free will? Is it the hand of God, if chance it be? And I think these, with that quote from the beginning, where whoever attempts to divert the will of God shall prove but his instrument in devising things more wonderful, so moving from these kind of songs of hopelessness i'd like to go to the songs of actual magic of which there are quite a few more um i won't go into them in too much detail um but there's one where again it's Beren and luthien a lot of these is luthien actually because she's an incredibly powerful elf maiden um but the first one is Beren and uh, Beren has recruited finrod one of the elven kings to um to go and help him get into Angband to steal the Silmaril and so he disguise himself as orcs but then Sauron captures them and Finrod who's the elven king he and Sauron have an actual singing battle they sing the songs to each other Sauron is singing songs of opening and displaying and unearthing and revealing and Finrod is singing songs of concealing and safety and holding and strength um, but in the end, Sauron's magic proves too strong for Finrod, uh, Finrod, and they are displayed to be this elves and humans in disguise, and they get chucked into prison, and everyone dies apart from Beren. Um, because Luthien rescues him. Luthien appears and sings more powerful songs of opening, which are actually stronger than Sauron's, and she actually opens up the prisons of Sauron's um, his fortress she opens up the prisons and all the prisoners escape just by singing songs now i did mention a song in the third age which uh sam sings and this is absolutely beautiful um it's a similar sort of situation to when fingon was talking or was looking for madros and it's at the it's at the tower of Kirithungal, and it doesn't crop up in film, I don't believe, which is a real bloody shame because it's absolutely beautiful. He's looking for Frodo. He's discovered that Frodo's alive, despite Shelob's best attempts. Um, he's scared all the orcs away because they think he's some mighty elf warrior, but he just can't find Frodo. He's gone to the top of the tower, and there's nobody there, and he's completely stuck. At last. Weary and feeling utterly defeated, he sat on a step below the level of the passage floor and bowed his head into his hands. It was quiet, horribly quiet. The torch that was already burning low when he arrived sputtered and went out, and he felt the darkness cover him like a tide. And then softly, 
to his own surprise, there at the vain end of his long journey and his grief, moved by what he thought his heart could not tell, Sam began to sing. His voice sounded thin and quavering in a dull, cold, dark tower, the voice of a forlorn and weary hobbit that no listening orc could possibly mistake for the clear song of an elven lord. He murmured old childish tunes out of the shire and snatched Mr Bilbo's rhymes that came into his mind, like fleeting glimpses of the country of his home. And then suddenly a new strength rose in him and his voice rang out while words of his own came unbidden to the simple tune. In western lands beneath the sun the flowers may rise in spring, the trees may bud, the waters run, the merry finches sing. Or there may be tis cloudless night and swaying beaches bare, the elven stars as jewels as white amid their branching hair. For here at journey's end I lie in darkness buried deep, beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep, above all shadows rides the sun, and stars forever dwell. I will not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. Beyond all towers strong and high he began again, and he stopped, short. He thought that he had heard, heard a faint voice answering him. And of course he does, because Frodo is actually just in the room above him, and he hadn't seen the stairs, he hadn't seen the trapdoor to get in. So, there is one more little point to discuss at the Third Age, and that is of course Tom Bombadil, who is really awkward and sort of breaks Tolkien's law slightly because Tom Bombadil was kind of shoehorned in from um, his own Tales of the Perilous Realm section. But I think there's a reason that Tom Bombadil is who he is, and that's because everything he sings, everything he says, he sings. All of Tom Bombadil's uh, words, all of his phrases, all of his speaking parts are in iambic pentameter and all in rhyming couplets. So even when he's not singing, even when he's just speaking, he's got that dot, 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 dot kind of rhythm because everything he says is written in iambic pentameter. And of course, when he's getting Merry or Pippin, I always forget which one it is, out of the tree, he sings a song to open the tree. When he rescues them from the Barrow Whites, he sings a song to open at the Barrow White, just like Luthien sings a song to open at the prisons of Sauron. And I think the reason that everything Tom sings, everything Tom says he sings, I think it's because he is an entirely magical being. He is an exhalation of the life of the earth. And uh, yeah, the reason he sings everything is because the being of pure magic. He's a total fairy, literally and figuratively. So that's my thoughts on songs in the Silmarillion, the songs in the Third Age. I hope you enjoyed it, and please do join me next time for a little bit more lore and a little bit more history of the elves and the Zilmarillion. Alright, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.